um, I, will, I will hand the mic over to Dr. Suruchi Chandra. She is our keynote speaker for the day. Dr. Chandra is a board certified psychiatrist who specializes in integrative and holistic approaches for challenging emotional, behavior, behavioral, and medical conditions. So thank you. You should just be able to advance. So I may not be the most obvious choice for a keynote speaker on infectious disease. I'm a psychiatrist. But there's more and more um, evidence coming out that behind many psychiatric illnesses, there is a connection and a link with the immune system and infections. So in many ways, this is innovative and the future of medicine. But it's also the history of psychiatry and medicine, but a part of history that's been forgotten. So in the 1800s, there was a condition called general paresis, which was a psychiatric condition. And it was common. It was as common as 12% of asylum patients in New York. And now we don't see it. Even those of us who are medically trained probably never saw a case of general paresis. And that's because it was discovered to be caused by syphilis. And with the advent of antibiotics, we no longer see it. But what we were taught as psychiatrists during my training is that we never want to ascribe a lifelong psychiatric diagnosis to a patient without identifying a reversible infectious cause. So you don't want to say someone has bipolar disorder when you have something you can treat caused by infection. So every patient that I saw during my training who was hospitalized for the first time, we tested for syphilis. But we never tested for Lyme disease, even though I did my training just a few miles from Old Lyme, Connecticut. So we learned the specific lesson of looking for syphilis, but not the more general lesson of thinking about the immune system and other, um, Ill other infections. And there's a lot of commonality between syphilis and Lyme disease. They're both spirochetes, so they're both spiral bacteria. They both can start on the skin and progress. And then as they progress, they get more into the central nervous system. And they've both been called the great imitator because they can imitate so many different medical illnesses and psychiatric. So in the literature, we know that Lyme disease can present as a mood disorder, as a psychotic disorder, as OCD, and even dementia. So the last 10 years, fast forward, I didn't do any testing for Lyme disease or tick-borne infections during my training. And I never even thought about asking, have you had exposure? Have you been bitten by a tick at any point? Now, the last 10 years of my practice has really been focused on how do I help those patients that other psychiatrists can't? So I've had to have a really broad view and look at things that are in the literature that are evidence-based, but maybe other psychiatrists and medical doctors aren't looking at. And one of those things, and probably the thing that's been the most valuable, is looking at Lyme disease as well as other vector-borne infections. So observations from my clinic in the last decade. One, about 25 to 30 percent of my patients have a vector-borne infection contributing to their psychiatric presentation. And I know that sounds like a big number, but I looked at the numbers over the last year just to make sure that I wasn't exaggerating. And I'm not saying it's the cause, it's a contributor. But in every case, it's enough of a contributor that my patient would not have gotten well if we hadn't diagnosed it and paid attention to it. So this isn't a small problem in my experience. And these patients don't look like the patients that we think about from the CDC criteria. So they come to me with chronic symptoms. They've been sick for years, maybe decades. And they have prominent psychiatric and neurologic symptoms primarily or in addition to the more rheumatologic symptoms that we think of with Lyme disease. Many don't recall a tick bite. Some do, but many don't. And almost none recall an EM rash. And despite seeing many doctors, on average, I think my patients have seen five to 25 doctors, often 10 at least. Despite seeing many doctors, most of them never had any testing for Lyme disease, almost none. And when they did ask for a test. Let's say they had a tick bite. They were told often, Lyme disease isn't present in California. You're not in Connecticut. You're not in Massachusetts. So this could be the end of the talk, because it could just be the lesson that we need to test for Lyme disease. And it's not that simple. So what I've learned from trying to understand and help these patients is that it's not enough to think about tick-borne illnesses. We need a whole new paradigm in understanding both the diagnosis and treatment to really help these 
patients that have the chronic presentations, not necessarily acute. But to really help these chronic patients, we need to have a different way of thinking than is emphasized in medical training, and at least in my medical training. So the three things I'd like to weave into this talk, and hopefully throughout the um, day, are shifting the paradigm and looking at three things. One is going from a simple model to complex models that look at connections. So not just looking at single systems, but looking at how they connect. So for example, thinking about the immune system, if you see a psychiatric patient. Thinking about an infection, if somebody comes with you with first onset of panic disorder at 72, which happened to me recently. So thinking about that. And then going beyond managing symptoms to really think about building resilience in the system so that our patients can manage these exposures and stay well. And even to healing, which is the concept I didn't learn about in medical school. But when we can heal, we should think about how do we do that? How do we help our patients do that? So first, let's talk about diagnosis. So most of you here know about the CDC criteria for Lyme disease. And it's based on the ELISA test as a screening tool and then the more confirmatory tests with the Western bot. And both of these tests involve an immune response. So um, the Columbia University Medical Center, Lyme and Tick-Borne Disease Center, um, which Dr. Fallon heads, and he'll be here this afternoon, states that these criteria are useful for early stages of rheumatologic disease, but not as useful for chronic presentations with more neurologic involvement. So. The, the CDC criteria, which sometimes are used as absolute and rigid criteria, don't apply necessarily to these more chronic and especially neurologic systems. So we need another way of diagnosing and thinking about these patients. So what are some of the challenges? As I said, some of these patients don't recall a tick bite. They didn't have the rash. And the early symptoms can just be a viral-like illness. They could go hiking and then develop muscle pain, fever, and not think about um, a tick-borne infection. And then the presentations that are really debilitating may come years later. Another complicating factor is that our current tests look at the immune response. And one of the reasons is that to culture these bacteria is really hard. I think you heard about that yesterday. So we're relying on the immune system to make antibodies. There was a study done at UC Davis just about two years ago, or three years ago that looked at an animal model and the, um, these mice that were infected with Lyme disease. And what they found is that the Lyme disease, the Borrelia burgdorferi, suppressed the immune response. So the Borrelia burgdorferi went to the lymph nodes pretty soon after the exposure and downregulated the antibody production. So you have two things that could go on. One, the system, the mice or the human, would be less able to fight this infection. But then all our testing that rely on antibody production may not be accurate in picking up. And what I've seen in my patients, because I often work with families, is that often the sickest patient has the weakest antibody production. So the patient who may have very few symptoms will have a positive Western blot, an ELISA test, but the person who first came to me is barely positive. And that would make sense if the Borrelia burgdorferi was suppressing their immune system. But those are the patients who are often dismissed and told it's just in your head because we, we can't find the antibodies. So that's one complicating factor. The other complicating factor is that Lyme disease may not be just Borrelia burgdorferi. And that may sound complicated, um, that may sound um, nonsensical because that's what Lyme disease is. But when we think about the clinical presentation of our patients, it often involves more than just Borrelia burgdorferi. And there are co-infections that can be involved. And these co-infections include Bartonella species, Babesia, Ehrlichia, and Aplasma. And these co-infections may be transmitted by the same vector or tick, or they may be other vectors, including other animals. But because there's immune suppression, they become more active and prominent. So if you don't pay attention to these co-infections, the patients don't get well. What I've seen um, very, very common in my patients more recently is Babesia. And Babesia responds to different agents than Borrelia. So if the patient only gets doxycycline, they may have persistent symptoms. But they're told, well, you got the treatment. You had 21 days of doxycycline. So this is one complicating factor that not all doctors know that there are other infections that can lead to the clinical presentation. 
What's also complicating is some of these infections are emerging in that we're just learning about them. We're just identifying them and naming them. And often we don't have tests available. So on the West Coast, we recently found out the most common Borrelia species is not Borrelia burgdorferi, but it's Borrelia myomoto. And it was found through a Stanford study to be four or five times more common than Borrelia burgdorferi. So you could imagine if someone went to get a Lyme test, they would have only been tested for Borrelia burgdorferi, and they would have been told, you don't have Lyme disease. And that's because there wasn't a test available for Borrelia myomoto until recently. Babesia, the species that's more common on the West Coast, or at least we think is, is Borrelia um, duncani. And that was only discovered in the 1990s. So anyone who had that in the late 1980s, wouldn't have, we wouldn't have been able to identify it. So we have to keep this in mind and be humble that our patients may have an infection that we can't yet name or easily diagnose because we don't have a test. There was a study um, done in Northern California where I'm from, and often we don't think of this as a place with a lot of Lyme disease. This, um, the study was done in Sonoma County, which is north of the Bay Area. And they found that 23% of people had antibodies against a tick-borne infection. So these infections or exposure to these infections are not uncommon. That's almost one out of five. The most common was not Borrelia burgdorferi, it was Babesia, almost 17% of people. So this is a protozoa, and a lot of patients think, well, parasites, you don't get that in the developing world. So they're not testing for a protozoa, but 17% of people had exposure. Um, you may care more about the East Coast. There was a study done in Rhode Island, and it was about 12%. So again, similar numbers. But what was also important was not everybody was sick. They thought that about 27% of people had symptoms consistent with an illness. And those numbers may not be accurate because we don't always know which symptoms are associated with which infection. But we don't think that one out of five people are, is walking around with chronic Lyme. So why do some people get sick and not others? And that's where the Lyme disease presentation is more than just the microbes. We have to ask a story or ask our patients what is it that led them to be ill, and maybe not another person or another family member? So what is it in their narrative? What made them risk, um, more at risk to get sick? And looking at things such as stress, even early life developmental trauma, nutritional deficiencies, immune dysfunction, and imbalances in the microbiome, for example, prolonged antibiotic exposure, even as a child. And then when we diagnose Lyme disease, we also have to think about what did this bacteria, protozoa, do to the person? What's the aftermath? Because the symptoms that they're really suffering from may not be the infection only, or primarily, may also be what has come afterwards. So it's a complex, chronic illness, and we're going to have a lot of uncertainty at this point when we diagnose patients. A lot of our patients are not going to get clear test results, and I don't think we have the luxury of not diagnosing them. I don't think that's a choice we can make because these patients are really, really suffering. And while we're waiting for confirmatory tests, we have to look at the tools that we have, the tools that we were taught, starting with just careful, compassionate listening. And often these patients can tell you what they have. With Babesia, the patients have a signature. They often have air hunger, which is very different than asthma, night sweats, um, panic attacks that are new onset, not consistent with um, other trauma. So listening to the patients. Physical exam, Bartonella can have a very characteristic exam. And then biomarkers, even zinc and copper has been found to be, um, the ratio of zinc and copper has been found to be a biomarker for chronic infections. With all this, many patients will have a possible or probable diagnosis. And if we're thinking about just antibiotics, we may be left with this dilemma of treating or not treating. But I want to propose a third way of treating that allows us to take action in the setting of uncertainty. And we need better studies of these existing models. So for example, looking at the symptoms, which symptoms are really predictive of these co-infections? Um, which are the symptoms that we should act on? And again, I don't think we have the luxury of not diagnosing our patients because the cost is too great. Our patients, the patients we see, they've lost years of their lives. And it's especially tragic when I work with young adults because often they, don't, they never had any memories of being healthy as a child. And now they're trying to make their way in the world as somebody who didn't get to go through all those developmental steps. There is the financial hardship, lost income for the adult, medical costs for the family, and then the isolation, 
often these patients can't be out in the world because they're so fatigued or they're brain fog, so it's hard for them to have a conversation. So we have to have ways of acting with this uncertainty. So treatment, and we're looking again for how do we treat patients who have been sick for a long time and how do we have long-term improvement and how do we build resilience. So the CDC criteria, um, sorry, the CDC guidelines are really for patients who have acute illness. 21 days of antibiotics can be very effective if you've just had exposure, but for those of us who have been treating patients with chronic symptoms, it's often not enough. And there are reasons for that. So there have been multiple, multiple animal studies showing that Borrelia burgdorferi can survive or be persistent after antibiotics once it's chronic. And so this is a study looking at mice that found the antibiotics were not sufficient to get rid of the Borrelia if it had already become chronic. And there are different reasons. It's a really savvy organism. But one thing it can do is it can go from that spirochetal form into a cyst form, which is viable but resistant to antibiotics when exposed to things like antibiotics, heat, starvation. So it's really resistant. But then when the antibiotics are taken away, it can revert to the spirochetal active form. And in this study, the conclusion was that the antibiotic treatment was effective only in the earliest stages. And antibiotics such as penicillin and its derivatives, doxycycline, induce round body formation and quietening of the symptoms rather than a cure. So maybe the answer is more antibiotics than doing it IV. And this was a question done by Dr. Fallon in a study he did in 2008. So rather than doing just three weeks of antibiotics, he did 10 weeks of IV antibiotics. And the patients did get better. They had improvements in their cognitive symptoms, but they weren't sustained. So he concluded that they needed to find treatments that had more long-lasting improvement and that also carried less, uh, less risk. So a number of these patients had complications from the IVs. <coughs> and now we know that the gut microbiota, all those bacteria and viruses that are in our gut and in our skin, are vital for our health. So they are, they are our friends. We allow them to hang out because they do so much for us. And I hear patients come to me and say, well, it's OK. I did five years of antibiotics, but I took probiotics. The problem is there are at least 500 different species of bacteria and the other organisms that I mentioned. And the probiotics that we have available only have a few species. And none of them have the species that are actually the most abundant in our gut. So you cannot replace the microbiome with a few probiotics. You really have to preserve that microbiome. And the microbiome does so much for us. It helps not just with the obvious nutrition and nutrient extraction, but it's so much of our immune system. So if you're trying to fight a chronic infection, the last thing you want to do is mess with the microbiome. And then as a psychiatrist, I also <laughs> care about the microbiome because it's so vital for brain functioning and development. So the microbiome affects the brain through neurotransmitters, through metabolites, through the vagus nerve. And it's really critical during development. We know that, for example, if the microbiome is disrupted, it could contribute to even developmental delays. So I really want to preserve that healthy microbiome in my patients. But at the same time, we know that um, these infections in some people can persist. So what do we do? And before I talk about that, I just want to go through um, how much antibiotics is too much? And this is a question I wonder about. And there are not many studies. I did find this one study that looked at what, a course of, what one course of antibiotics can do to the microbiome. And they found that a short course, this is just five days, disrupted the microbiome by about 25%. And the microbiome reverted to about 90%, 89% after two months. <laughs> but there's still about 11% disturbance after one course. And in one out of six subjects, it didn't, it didn't repair. So that's a really short course. And I've noted a link, a hypothesis that I had, that my patients who had chronic antibiotics for things like Lyme disease or acne or ear infections seem to be at greater risk for depression and anxiety. But I've always wondered, again, how many courses do they need? Is it six months, two years? And there was a, finally a study done in 2015 and they found that a treatment with a single antibiotic course increased the risk of depression. And the risk went up with repeated and more frequent courses of antibiotics and was similar for anxiety. So again, antibiotics are necessary sometime, but we want to look at alternatives whenever we can. <coughs> 
So what are some of the alternatives? One thing that uh, uh, many of us who work with patients with chronic Lyme disease and co-infections um, have found to be helpful are the antimicrobial herbs. And these include cryptolepsis, cat's claw, astragalus, hutania, essential oils like clove oil. I was really biased when I first entered this field because I thought the antibiotics had to be more effective and stronger. I went to medical school. But now, having done this for over a decade, I've really come to appreciate how useful and effective these herbs can be. And one advantage they have is that they're really broad spectrum. So when we think about a pharmaceutical, it usually has one mechanism that it's effective. But the herbs have 10, 20, 200 different active molecules. So they often can go after a bacteria, but also a parasite and a virus. So when we think about co-infections that are emerging and we may not be able to identify, this strategy has some advantages. We also believe, we don't know, that it's safer long-term, both better tolerated and also less disruptive to the microbiome. But we need studies to really um, see if this hypothesis is true. There have not been a lot of studies. There have been clinical observations. Dr. Horwitz, I know, has used herbs, and he'll talk about, um, hopefully, some of his experience. But there, has, there was this one study done in Connecticut by Eva Sapi. And she compared, in the laboratory, not in humans, in the laboratory, she compared two herbs, cat's claw, which is cemento, and bondurol to doxycycline. So the green little dots are live Borrelia burgdorferi. The orange are dead ones. And you can see that in the control in the middle, there's many live Borrelia species. The cemento cat's claw gets many of them, and the bonderol does too. Um, that's why they're orange. When cemento and bonderol are used together, and that really seems to be key, using multiple herbs and essential oils together, there's almost no live species. Doxycycline was not as effective. So again, we can't say this is true for humans, but I do think it's encouraging along with the clinical observations. And treatment is more than killing the microbes. I can't emphasize that enough. When I first work with a patient, I rarely go after the microbes first. One, because they're often fragile, and we need to have them feel stronger, especially as killing um, sometimes can make them feel worse. But the long-term approach really is about building resilience, both so that the immune system can do its own job, they won't get re-exposure, and they can also be healthy. So we want to, again, look at both internal and external factors. External factors include stress, diet, environmental exposures, and toxins. Internal factors is the microbiome, mitochondrial health. Um, those are the little organelles inside each cell that produce ATP, but are also part of our innate immune system. And then also immune functioning as a whole, and the hormones can really be involved also. And then dealing with the aftermath. I believe Dr. Horowitz will talk about this in more depth, but again, just emphasizing that the clinical symptoms are not just the infections, but it's what the infections do. And we have to look at that. So as a psychiatrist, I know that in the literature, um, Lyme disease can decrease serotonin and increase the metabolites of kinurinic and quinolonic acid. So we look at, is there evidence of that? And how do we support the body and the brain? Is there inflammation? Can we support the mitochondria? So one advantage of the herbs is that they not only go after these microbes, but they have a lot of resilience building effects, and they can be protective. So hutania is an herb that I really like using, and it was found to protect the nervous system through the mitochondria. Cat's claw is another herb that um, a lot of patients use, and it was found to be um, anti-inflammatory and the same magnitude as a steroid, dexamethasone. So that's really powerful, that we, if we can get an herb without the risks of a steroid and dependency that may reduce inflammation in the same, to the same degree. And then cat's claw is also found to be protective against oxidative stress um, and neuroprotective. Rhodiola is another herb that I really like using. And rhodiola, um, one, is a complex herb. It has many active components. So because this is a complex illness and can affect different um, pathways, herbs like this can be especially beneficial. So rhodiola has been found to normalize the immune system, hormonal, and antioxidant parameters in patients with Parkinson's. And then there was a small study done in Southern California that found that rhodiola was as effective as a drug for generalized anxiety. So I often use it along with other things, especially magnesium, for patients who are sensitive to drugs or who want to avoid drugs for um, anxiety. Nutrition. 
So I can't emphasize how important this is, and that's what I spoke to Savi about and decided to do a, one of the groups with Vicky Kolbener on nutrition. So nutrition is the single most important thing we can do to build resilience. We all have a diet, so we might as well look at it. So nutrition can affect immunity, the microbiome, the mitochondria, and it provides um, fatty acids and uh, neurotransmitters to the brain. So diet, again, I tell patients, it can either be a source of stress or resilience. So diet can either support the microbiome or contribute to what we call dysbiosis. It can provide essential nutrients and building blocks for the body or lead to depletion. And it can either be inflammatory or anti-inflammatory. So this is usually the first thing that we start working on when patients come in. And then neuroplasticity. I want to mention this both because I'm a psychiatrist, but also because this is often the symptom that scares patients the most. Are they going to get their brains back? Are they going to be functioning again? So it might be a student or executive who has brain fog, who feels like they're developing dementia. And I've really been encouraged because I've seen so many patients get their capacity back with this more holistic, resilient building approach especially now that we know that the brain can heal and is plastic. So we want to look at evidence-based ways of supporting neuroplasticity, which includes diet, exercise, herbs. And more recently, we started introducing both neurofeedback and gentle neurostimulation as ways of um, healing the brain. So the way forward. The most important thing is that there is hope. Healing is possible. Um, it's just not available to enough people. So we need to make these ways of healing both better known and more accessible, more accessible in terms of having more practitioners that do this, more awareness, and then also financially. This isn't always affordable to everyone because insurance doesn't cover many of the treatments. And then we need more studies. We need treat studies not just on one mechanism, one drug for simple illness, but we need studies that look at this complex illness to help us determine which treatments are the most effective, understand the mechanisms, to understand who's going to benefit from this, because it's very individualized. What sequence? What do we do first, second, third? And these studies, I think, are best done by looking at patients who are getting treatment in practice-based settings. So, so I'll end the discussion here, and I know we'll have time for questions and answers later.